Hi, welcome to Upstream. So glad you're joining us today. I'm here with Sherry Worrell. Howdy doody. And Chet Lowe. Howdy doody? <laughs> Sherry, we already recovered once. Oh, I, I pulled that out of my childhood, sorry. Okay, yeah, howdy I like her. Good but, evening. No, but you said, howdy doody. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't even say it right. Hey, we're going to keep going on okay, this. Okay, so. no, let's go. Okay, great. All right, welcome. So glad you're here, Pastor Chet. Thank <laughs> I'm you. glad to be here. Uh, we are going to spend some time today in conversation. Uh, we'll spend a little bit of time from this past weekend's teaching on Acts 11, and then we'll jump into some questions that have come in from the body. Uh, before we do any review, though, if I could just open us up in a word of prayer, and then we'll jump in. Lord, so thankful for your great grace in our lives and uh, God, the teaching from this past weekend and the call that you've given us to be your ambassadors following the example that's been set for us. God, I pray that uh, our character would be evident to the world that we truly are Christ followers. So Lord, as we discuss and have conversation, um, Lord, would you use it for your glory? In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Uh, I mean, really, we talked, you gave 10 points uh, this past weekend. You wrapped up Acts 11 in our Acting Out series. How many points did I give? I 10 from what I gathered. And I was under 40 minutes. I don't know if that's true, but we'll go with it. I, well, Share, there's no... Oh, I was a little over. <laughs> How did we just go from under 40 minutes to a little over? Because I looked at Allison and she shook her head no. Oh. <laughs> Uh, it was a good message, though. It really was. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I know, I'm not saying, yeah, I agree. Yeah. It really sprung from something the Lord was doing in me in defining Christianity. Hmm. I, I've just been really evaluating my own personal life and what people see in me, from my wife to my children to my dearest of friends, um, and what levels... Do people see that in me? Um, and I think because of that, it's so obvious to see, like, this is what they saw in these people because it was just who they were, whether they were at the food store, grocery store, or whether they, and that's a synonymous term, food and grocery store, um, or they were <clears throat> in church. It's just yeah. they were. An observation I made um, when I was writing um, upstream this, no, on course this week, was it was a term that was given to them. They didn't choose it. Mm -hmm. they, didn't, they didn't select a, a title or a, a term of distinction for themselves. It was a term that was given to them okay. out of the observation that they made uh, of their lives. So. Yeah, and you and I had a Monday driveway theological conversation. Um, Sherry stopped by uh, for just a minute. It was uh, <laughs> we always go straight into some form of heart, and um, you know one of the things I didn't mention it, it was a name given to them. Uh, some theologians believe that it was a derogatory term, um, that it was um, oh the Christites. You know, it's like they follow mm -hmm. one God. They follow even used in a derogatory yeah. sense or like a almost a curse kind of thing upon them they were known wouldn't you like to be known as a little a little christ a little christ you betcha right? yeah. i'll take that one all day every day <laughs> i, I know, mean that right? would be um you know a remarkable moniker on somebody mm -hmm. uh, to have that kind of a term yeah. so true yeah. so true yeah those um those 10 points and i'm wondering if uh, either of you want to elaborate on on any of them. Uh, the first one, a gracious group, second missional, they stepped out of comfort zone, they were Jesus people, transformational, inspirational, hungry for the word, evangelistic, complimentary, not competitive, and generous. Uh, that was their reputation as being those people. Yeah. Um, so a uh, very good friend of mine, Jeff Gill, he uh, really has taught me number nine in such a great way. Um, mm. He has always been a person that uh, doesn't care for his name to be out there. He cares that God's kingdom is advanced. He's such a Barnabas. 
And whether it's him teaching or someone else teaching or he provides an opportunity for someone or, and I really, I, I've looked at his life as real deal. Like, you know, that's a, that's a real deal kind of person. And I desire to be that. I, uh, and I think for me, um, it's, it's uh, just really purposing to see the potential in someone and give them wings to fly to advance God's kingdom. Amen. Uh, great. I'm, you also made a note of um, even just the, the difference from one verse to the next and the amount of time that passes. Sherry, I know that's something that kind of piqued your, your interest in just the, hey, there's four years between this and this. Yeah, um, I, I think people, we've talked about it before, generally think if you turn the page in your Bible, it's the next day. Mm-hmm. And um, one of the things that a careful detailed study like we're doing through the book of Acts affords us is time to do a little study on our own uh, outside. And so I would encourage our body uh, to do um, what I did this afternoon. I just typed in um, chronology or timeline of the book of Acts and and uh, they'll fuss about whether it was 63 or 64 but uh, AD, but it is close enough. Mm-hmm. You can then take your Bible and write in the margin four years later, three years later, mm-hmm. two years later, 12 Great years pot, later. Sherry. That's really practical and really good. And really easy to do. And, and I think it sets perspective. So like, for example, uh, he, he said four years. Okay, so, so let's take from the founding of the church at Antioch, Antioch until Paul's first missionary journey starts. It's four more years. Mm-hmm. It's not the next day. It's, you know, three or four, depending on which date you want to get. you know that kind of color, what happens is Paul doesn't go to Antioch and the next month Spirit calls him and he goes out. He's faithful to teach the Bible for four years. He's a Sunday school teacher living in Antioch, teaching the Word of God to Gentiles. Like, that's just some faithfulness where then at a worship service, four years later, the Spirit says, set apart for me uh, this guy that's faithfully serving. <laughs> and chronologies help us too, like looking at his missionary journeys. Again, if we turn the page, we think, you know, oh, he went to the next town. He may have been somewhere two years. He may have been somewhere six months. Mm. He may have ta- it may have taken time uh, to develop a rapport with those people before a church ever really uh, formed. And then the relationships within the church. And then pull in the, the preacher boys to become the, the pastors of it. So I think our chronology helps. So I just was going to say, you made the comment, and I think it affords everyone else a chance. And we've got tools readily available to us. Write some things in the margin of your Bible. Give yourself a, a chronology of the book of Acts. It might help. Yeah, I, some people are like... The Bible is a holy book, so you can't make notes, you can't underline. I always appreciate you. Hey, circle this word. Hey, you may want to underline this, and it really is helpful for the study of the word. Yeah, and I actually, when I'm teaching, I'll go through, I'll read it. I won't mark anything. Mm -hmm. I'll read it straight through. I'll read it again. Usually the second and third time, I'm starting to pick out the main word. So when I'm saying, hey, I've circled this in my Bible. Mm. It's because I really think that word is a Holy Spirit, like I'm trying to get this across to you. Um, And I've actually got a Bible program called Logos. And um, after I'll do that, they actually have like, they do these word clouds and like the biggest word that will come out. And I'll compare my word to their word Mm. to see if we picked out the same thing. Like, hey, am I on track here? You know, in that kind of way. Great. Great. Well, we had some questions come in regarding the teaching. Uh, This first one, which of the 10 qualities do you think we struggle with most as the church at Coast Hills? And how can we grow in that? So let me be senior pastor. I think because of what I, I pray humbly communicated earlier, I think we struggle with the word Christian. Um, There's a coolness about our culture, that stepping outside of the comfort zone, being transformational, we're a more of a go with the flow. Let's not be too outspoken. Let's just be in our suburb. Let's just, you know, be this thing. Um, and we have more of a, uh, like a go with the flow, not spirit flow, but just kind of let's just stay within the norm. These people were not in the norm. They were noticeably different. And so I think as, as it was convicting for me, let me say as the senior pastor, I would say the answer for me to that question is Christian. Yeah, I picked it apart a little bit more. Um, 
I said I, I had three. Uh, the three that I think, as a culture, the representatives of our culture that are in our church struggle with these three, being missional, mm -hmm. stepping out of our comfort zone, and a hunger for the word. So by missional, and that I think that's a question too, isn't it? I don't want to jump ahead. I, you know. Yeah, there is a question on that. Um, I don't think people really understand what the church is supposed to be, what the mission of the church is, nor do they really understand what it's their, what is their mission or their part in in a, in a church. So I think there's a lack of understanding and a lack of willingness to be missional, to actually come to church for the right reasons, to participate as a body, to serve, to give, to be a resource, f as a pursuant to the mission. So I, I don't think I don't think South County folks are very missional in a spiritual sense. I think it has to go with what I was saying. Yeah. We're, we're a go with the flow kind of uh, people group here in South County. And our flow is more, um, I don't want to offend anyone. I, I'm, I might be a little bit more concerned about my relationship with them than I am their relationship with God. And we as pastors, we met um, and we, uh, came up with a few words that we feel like the body needs to be discipled in. And let me say, it sprung from our own personal evaluation of ourselves, because as the leader, so the people. Yeah. Um, and so we started there, and we ended up with a few words that um, really, I think, this highlighted. And I, I really believe that if people can, your, your thought, if we can begin to hunger for the word, and grasp Acts chapter 11 in regards to what they saw as a Christian and start, and the next question, sorry to jump ahead, but how can we grow in that? Mm -hmm. Just start applying it. So be transformational, be inspirational, be hungry for the word. If you just make a step of faith in one of these areas, the others are going to start to flow. So I, I want to maybe pick on that just for a second. So if the way that I grow in it is I'm in the word and then I'm living that out and applying it, but I don't have a hunger for the word, then I've got to start, like, what does that look like? How do I enter into that? Well, like most, like most disciplines, it begins with the decision. Mm -hmm. You know, I will, whatever. It's not I feel like it or I want to, it's I will. And so maybe the discipline of being a student of God's word begins the same kind of thing. I will be in God's word tomorrow morning at 730. Mm -hmm. I will. I just will. And then the next morning I will. And the next morning I will. And the next morning I will. Mm -hmm. um, there are so many tools and so much available. There is no excuse for someone to not be in God's word mm -hmm. in some form or fashion every single day. Yeah. Uh, but it's a, it's a personal habit and it's a discipline. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm going to boil it down to it's creating the habit. I'm not, I wish I could be a tool person. Um, I find myself a week into tools and like I, I stray. Like right now I'm in the book of Jeremiah. I couldn't take it anymore. So I, I studied First Thessalonians this morning. <laughs> I, I just couldn't take any more repent, return. You know, you wretched people. Clean, <laughs> clean up your act. Judgment's coming. <laughs> yeah, I'm going through Jeremiah. I'm like, enough already, Jeremiah. Give me a break. <laughs> so I need a little bit of like, oh, I love you, church. First Thessalonians, you know. Um, so I kind of broke my own tool in a sense. But the key for me is what you said creating a habit. Um, and I think it's, you know, uh, Sherry, you're a little hard on me about memorizing phrases of verses uh, before, right? And it's, it, all I think I was trying to do is take baby steps. Sure. So maybe read a verse, download the Bible app and meditate on the verse of, a day, of the day. Start there, you know, let it mm -hmm. pop up on your phone and think about it for five and pray about it for five minutes. Um, one of the things I think as well is praying through scripture. It helps you marinate in it for a little while. That's great. Yeah. And maybe, maybe along that journey, you find someone else who's in a similar situation and they can help be a, a source of accountability that says, Hey, I'm going to commit to this. I want to do it. Will you do it with me? I think for me that that's always helpful. It's yeah. a good practical word too. I got an email and someone asked me, Hey, um, I really f am finding it difficult to give the gospel. So my response is, just pray the Lord provides an opportunity for you to make it easy. So instead of you having to like jump into a fire and, okay, you need Jesus, otherwise you're going to hell, just pray and say, Lord, today would you provide an opportunity for me? 
Yeah. I'm going to look for that opportunity that you provide. Uh, if you can start there, uh, you may not lead anyone to Jesus for a year, but at least you're taking steps to be yeah. able to. Yeah. Great. Uh, I think you guys even already started speaking to this next question. How do we break down the walls that are up in South County for the sake of the gospel? How do we break down those walls? Yeah, Zach, I, I, sometimes I think our questions come from our fears. Um, hmm. For a moment, think of these two Jewish guys who are unnamed it's from Cyprus and Cyrene. All we know is they're guys from Cyprus and Cyrene going to the completely pagan Antioch. So different from Jonah, right? Send me to Nineveh. I don't want to go. These guys, I want to go. And where's the Gentiles? Think how difficult it was for them to say one thing to one person. When gods are all around them, you got Zeus in one temple, you got mm -hmm. Venus in another, you got, I mean, you got the Roman gods in every store burning incense, the whole deal. And these guys walk into this pagan culture. It's no different than us. It's the prayer of Acts chapter 4. Hey, Lord, we just suffered. Would you give us boldness? Because we're a little nervous right now. It's Paul who's there praying in Acts 18. Jesus shows up. Don't be afraid. I got many people in the city. Lord, I'm afraid. Help me. He shows up. Don't be afraid. So even the apostle Paul struggled with it. I think it's just a matter of doing it. Just ask the Spirit of the Spirit of God would never ask us to do something that He won't empower us to, to be able to do it. I took a slightly different tact. I was thinking from a more from a standpoint of uh, the walls that exist between us and neighbors and and coworkers and and people that we socialize with. Um, from a standpoint of of how to reach out and and I and I I was thinking about it. it's it's really quite quite simple. It's the idea of, of being less concerned about ourselves and more concerned for someone else. So back to your comment about are we most interested in our relationship or the relationship that person has with Almighty God. I, I, loving people opens the door for the gospel mm. to come out. Mm. When, when we go out of our way to, mm. to care for right. someone, when, when we're generous with time or money or whatever, and, and and we do so with a heart of love and a big old smile on our face, we've just opened the door. Uh, the likelihood is the person is far more interested in what we might have to say after we've displayed that care and concern in some practical way. So and let me give you a practical I, I, I way I would to, give that as a suggestion. That. Ask questions about them. Yeah, not How about are you? How's your grandkids? How are your kids? How's work? How are you doing? Walk away with, hey, I'm going to pray for you about that. I mean, there's, there's practical ways to engage in conversation. I, well, Time and I were on a, uh, we were walking the dog and um, there's a guy who has another dog in our neighborhood. So I used the dog to initiate conversation and it ended up in a 45 minute dialogue of connection. So it, it's just an opportunity to find a way in. That's all you got to do. Just f and usually asking questions about them. Yep, that's a good idea too. Great, great. Thank you for that. Uh, this next question, is a mission trip what you mean by missional? I've heard that some people believe short-term mission trips do more harm than good. Why would someone believe that? Well, first off, that's not what that word means. To be missional is just to to agree with, buy into, participate in the mission of the institution. So every, every business in South Orange County has a mission statement. Mm. And the people who are missional in that organization, they know the statement, they know what it means, and they're marching after it. Mm. So um, the, the term does not mean missions trips. It means to be focused on the actual mission of the, in this case, our church. But you take the one about the question about the short-term mission trips. Well, I'm going to accentuate what you said. Um, so Jesus called them disciples. Sorry, called them servants, disciples, friends, apostles, um, and then brothers, right? So he went from, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. And then after the resurrection, he says, go tell my brothers, there was this development of relationship where they got the mission. Mm -hmm. They went from just listening to what he had to say and doing what he said to do to catching it. And I think that is missional. You, we catch 
the heartbeat of Jesus and communicate that out to our world, right? Um, and uh, the second question that you, you referred to me was um, the, I've heard that some uh, people believe that short-term mission trips um, are actually harmful. Right. Um, yes and no. Um, so we received mission trips when we were in Liberia and we had a lot of recovery when people left. You know, there, it's just the reality of it. Um, and they helped us do a lot of great work and got a lot of things accomplished to help us move our vision forward. Mm -hmm. So I think there's good and bad anytime you're dealing with humanity, but you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah. We are called by Jesus to go. That's the word, go. So not to go and using the excuse of, well, I've heard they're more harmful than helpful, so I'm just going to stay home and I'll support the missionary that's there. The call of Jesus, catching his heartbeat, go. So my heart is, I'm going. And the go was, go to Jerusalem, go to Judea, Samaria, go to the end of the earth. That's not a, prog that's not a progression, that's interaction. So I'm going to all of them. Yeah. Great. Uh, someone asked, your story from the 12-year-old at Watts really struck me. It struck me. Me mm -hmm. too. Youth have so much zeal and passion and so little fear. How do I overcome my fear of failure and regain my belief that God could use me to change the world? Don't you love the heart of whoever wrote that? Yeah. I love it. That's great. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Sherry, what would you say? Um, I, I would say do it afraid. Like so many things in life, um, when fear rears, rears its ugly head, if we stop, uh, we're going to lose out on so much, uh, specifically here, the blessing of God to be participating in what he's asked us to do. So we need to do things even though we're afraid. So do it afraid. Um, I, take, I take some solace from passages in Psalms uh, where, where David says, like Psalm 56, when I was afraid, I did these things. Yep. It was an acknowledgement that he was afraid. Mm -hmm. Anyone who's honest any Christian that's honest is going to say there are any number of things that cause them fear and anxiety and, and, and ramp that on up to, to, you know, absolutely freezing them in some situations. Mm -hmm. So I would say, just keep moving uh, do it afraid, uh, put a big smile on your face, yeah. grab the whole armor of God and give it a shot. Yeah. I'll refer back to the message, right? They were willing to come out of their comfort zone. Yeah. I think um, sometimes fear is attached to being uncomfortable. And so coming out of your comfort zone, um, and I love what you said, do it afraid. You know, if I'm gonna bungee jump or jump out of an airplane, or I'm gonna jump off this cliff into this water, right? There's a little fear attached to it, but I do it. I do it for the rush, I do it for whatever it is. There's a, there's a reason that I choose to do it. I couldn't even do it because of peer pressure, you know? Mm -hmm. What greater reason just to do something than to grow as a believer and to advance the kingdom of God? Yeah. Let that be our motivation alone. Yeah. That's great. Good. Well, I think that wraps up our uh, review of the teaching from this last week and some of those questions. We've had a lot of questions come in, a few we didn't get to last week, just from uh, general biblical or practical life questions. This first one, is there a biblical argument against abortion that you could share wanting to get more solid in my defense of what I believe? Um, I didn't have as good an answer as he had last week, uh, the material that's on uh, Focus for the Family. Um, I was just saying a, an, another great way to approach it is to, to take the verses in Psalm 139 and use them in a, a very solid, thoughtful, careful, not argument, but discussion that leads you to conclude that, 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 that the unborn is in the unborn is in, indeed a baby, uh, a life. Uh, I didn't have a more specific answer than that. Yeah, I, I'll just reemphasize, focus on the family. Um, they ask a series of, I think, 15 to 20 questions that people ask. And they have a scripture that's attached to each and every single one of them. And I just really thought everything from, um, it's just a fetus. And God says to Jeremiah, I knew you in your mother's womb. Um, Proverbs, speak out for those who can't speak for themselves. Um, I would just like to say, I think there's a way to do it. Um, and I have made it clear, I'm not a picket-carrying, um, Bible-thumping 
uh, Christian. I think that there's a way to minister truth and we could, instead of being known for what we're against, we can be, and that doesn't mean you're not standing for truth at all. The way you stand for truth is just as important as the truth itself. Um, and so I can give my kids a Christmas gift wrapped in garbage and they're going to, it's going to be the last gift they open. I put a nice red paper on it with a bow. That's the first one they're going to get. Presentation's important. And Jesus showed us that with the Samaritan woman. He was very truthful, very compassionate, very loving. Um, and she was very wrong. And he was very truthful to let her know how wrong he yeah. was. But the way he did it mm. was through his compassion. Mm. And so I think that we've, uh, every time I speak on abortion, I make the assumption two-thirds of the women in the audit uh, auditorium have gone through the experience or know some woman that has. And so if it was my daughter, how would I want someone to speak to her about something that she did that felt like, and that's the way I approach it, mm -hmm. because I want to minister to God's daughter, and I want God's daughter to know she's loved, and I want God's creation, who's a woman, who's gone through that experience, to know she's loved, and she can be forgiven by Jesus Christ. And the, and the second part of that, the, the, the statement you made that do people know what, you know, what we're for or, or do they only know what we're against? Mm. And I think in the, in the, under the banner of, of responding to the, the unconscionable uh, number of murders that have happened in our, in our country under the banner of, of abortions, we, we could do a far better job of reaching out to those young girls uh, mm -hmm. instead of screaming and hollering with a placard in our hand. We could provide alternatives for them. We could provide finances for them. We could provide homes and caring and structure and love and all those things. Uh, we do a very poor job of that. We're much better at the screaming and hollering. Mm -hmm. And at no point would I suggest that that means it isn't wrong or we shouldn't stand against. But I'm saying, I'm agreeing with you that there are some things we can stand for yeah. that will help our message be received. Look at the Apostle Paul. He contended in Acts chapter 9. He reasoned in Acts 24. Something happened in his growth. Because in Acts 9, they tried to kill him twice. So his approach changed. <laughs> and obviously he was beheaded because he stood by truth. But it wasn't because he was in a fight and in an argument. He was constantly trying to plea. And he really learned that lesson. And I will say, and matter-of-factly, I think screaming and yelling to accomplish the point, I've done it. And I've confessed that sin to the Lord. I have been a banner-holding, look-like-hate person. And I have confessed that. And I will say, I think it's sinful. I think that to scream and yell, and someone will come to me, well, why won't you go stand for abortion? My question to them is, do you tithe? Because do not steal is very connected to do not murder as far as I know in the Ten Commandments. And I'm not making light of abortion at all. How I deal with one, I need to deal with all. And so I want to love the person. I want them to know how embraced they can be by Jesus Christ, not how condemned they are because of what they did. Because I'd be condemned if it wasn't for the cross. Amen to that. Amen. Great words. Do you have any perspective on the book Emotionally Healthy Spirituality? Uh, I think that's by Peter Scazzaro. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, he's from New Life Fellowship in Queens, New York. Go ahead, Jay. No, you first. Um, I'm concerned with his definition of sin. Um, it seems to be a little Robert Schuller-ish. Um, that's the essence of sin is a bad self-esteem. Um, so I think that uh, I, I'm concerned about his definition of sin. I'm concerned about his, his process to health uh, in the book. And this is me doing research about the book and reading quotes uh, from the book on both sides mm -hmm. and not reading the book itself. And so I would say um, his definition of sin and his process is something that I'm concerned about. Yeah, I have not read the book either. Uh, read about it, read commentaries and blah, blah, blah. Uh, not commentaries, reviews. Um, my concern is the, the, the process of mixing uh, psychology with theology. What tends to happen is that there is so much emphasis on self-worth mm -hmm. that, um, you know, it's, it's, 
it's, uh, it's too much, uh, what would you say, too much focus on self and very little focus on, on God. And therefore, the, 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 the attention is all on me, yeah. not on me before a holy and righteous God. And I think that gets dangerous. Anytime, anytime all of it is on me, I feel the same way about music, Christian music. Sometimes I'll be sitting, sitting not here, but listening to music. And uh, I'll go. Wait a minute. I, t- that is all about me. There's not a. There's not a. There's not a word in there of, of worship or of attending to to, to the honor that go, should go to him. So I think that's what happens when you mix a lot of uh, psychology and a little bit of theology. You, you get a. You get a, a, a cake that that's not going to rise very much. Yeah, you're going to get a flat cookie. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with that, and um, I think that you've highlighted my my concerns in regards to the def- his definition of sin. Um, Jesus said at the end of his life, and all of us should have this desire, I have glorified you on earth. I did what you asked me to do. Mm-hmm. Didn't matter how I feel about it. Didn't matter what I thought about it. I did it because you asked me to do it, and that glorified you. And I think this book, the other, I think the other concern is getting back to our roots like you, the childhood, this, that's, and the others. And sorry, I'm, I'm making somewhat light of it. I know our, our foundational, I believe our foundational formative years are so important, so I'm not taking from that. But according to the Word of God, our suffering produces perseverance. Our perseverance produces character. <coughs> our character produces hope. And so anything <laughs> that leads me to being a victim instead of leading to victory, I have concerns about. And, and our culture is just filled with that. Our culture is filled with the concept or idea that either forces that were around us or family situations or whatever have, have put us in a place where we need to you know, fight our way out. And the Christian perspective is, is not to fight our way out. Um, there may be issues to address, there may be things to, to look at, there may be help that's needed, but ultimately, God's not wasting a single experience in any of our lives. So true. Hmm. So true. That's a, such a great thought. And uh, the only thing I would say to that, Sherry, is um, I know there's a lot, I think that we are living in the Garden of Eden post-fall. And to, for me, the second sin was blame. And blame leads you Mm. to being a victim instead of believing that Jesus can use even the worst of situations to let you be a a victor. And our faith is the victory. So whatever we've passed through, the truth of Scripture is always true. Our suffering leads to perseverance, perseverance to character, Mm. character to hope. Great. I'm, I'm really interested to hear your guys' thoughts on this next question. I'm currently working at a church where I don't always feel spiritually fed. This church also believes that when we become a Christian, life is no longer about us, but the lost. I partially agree with this, but I also believe we need to be fed so we can feed others. I believe God has called me to work there, but struggle that I'm not being spiritually fed. What should I do? <laughs> You first. (laughs) (laughs) First of all, um, it sounds like the church is very evangelistic. And there's nothing wrong with being evangelistic. Uh, Preach the gospel is part of the commission. Um, The second part of the commission is make disciples. Uh, And I would agree with the statement, um, and I said this past weekend, Chuck Smith was very famous for saying, healthy sheep beget more sheep. And so someone who's being discipled is going to naturally be evangelistic. Uh, I just think that that's a truth about uh, the Word of God. Um, As the senior pastor of a church, I know I'm often judged as to what my church is and what my church isn't and what I believe and what I don't believe because of some action that they saw or experienced, right? Right. So I'm always very careful to put any judgment on another church because I know it happens to me and someone will leave and ask, someone else is upstream. Now, my church doesn't believe in discipleship, you know, (laughs) in that sense. Um, But one of the things that I love about the Apostle Paul at the end of his life, hey, when you come, 
bring my parchments and my scrolls. He was a personal studier. He, he just wanted to continue to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's why I told Timothy, be strong in the grace. Know your stuff, Timothy, because when you know it, you're going to live it. And so I just think a personal, being a personal studier is something that I would add to, uh, to, to the diet of this person that's asking the question. I think uh, this would be a great, whoever this person is, I would love to have a personal conversation with them. <laughs> because I, I don't want to miss, uh, you know. I asked this question. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to assume what their motive was or what was behind right, the question. Right. That, that's dangerous to do. But it does sound a little South County-ish in that people evaluate and choose to participate in churches Kind of like how we choose grocery stores, or as you would say, food stores. Thank you. You know, we're, we're, we're looking for a particular label, a particular kind, a particular emphasis. This one's got, you know, better fruit uh, aisle than that one. This one's got a better, you know, meat mm -hmm. than that one or, or whatever. We, we kind of evaluate our churches that way, too. Well, this one's got a little, you know, that, uh, the, the Bible talks about the whole counsel of God. And the whole counsel of God is going, to, is going to sweep through and include evangelistic efforts, discipleship efforts, um, worship efforts, one-on-one uh, -on -one efforts, uh, foreign missions efforts. Big I mean, group efforts, small group, group efforts, efforts. Small group you know, efforts. Planting churches. Uh, yeah, planting everything. churches, ministries to this and that mm -hmm. and those and them and theirs. Um, you know, not who's got the best fruit aisle or some other specific. So I, I would say to this person, you know, he says, um, I believe God has called me there, but I struggle with not being spiritually fed. It, you can't go to church and not be spiritually fed. So if this person in, in reality is, is participating as if it were a job description, but he's not growing because he's not being given uh, both the milk and the meat of God's word, then he needs to move on. That would be my opinion. I love your choice of pronoun. It's a he that is this person. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or she, or she. <laughs> no, but, and I'm glad you pointed that out because one of the things, Zach, that I wanted to add was, um, but I also believe we need to be fed um, so that we can feed others. Uh, For sure. If you walk in with the perspective of, I'm not going to gain something today, you ain't gaining nothing. But God's word doesn't return void. John 3, 16, every time I read it, I grab something new from it. Because I walk in with the perspective that God's word is living and active. So I would encourage a perspective shift and say, okay, today I'm walking into the church that I'm called to, and I'm going to ask the Lord, give me something that I can take from here. Let this apply to me. Well, and to not... It, not talking about this person now because I don't want them to be offended, but there are a lot. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about myself. I have come to church on several occasions looking for my blessing. Well, it's not all about me. Mm. It might be the blessing the guy next to me or the one behind me needs. And my evaluation of the message or the way the, the service developed or the fact that so-and-so did such and such and boy, that was, why, why are they doing that? I, it may not be about me. It may be about, the whole message may have been for the guy sitting right over there and he needed to hear something. And it wasn't the thing that I wanted to hear. Yeah, I think that's good. So Moving we need to be a little careful about the consumerism. That's what I was going to say. The consumerism that, that, that thrusts us into a church marketplace. Uh, it's not a healthy thing to do. I'll speak from me. Yeah, I don't think Toyota helps us out. They come out with a new car every year, and your <laughs> year-old car looks old. It looks ancient because they come out with a new design. It breeds consumerism, and we don't realize how consumer-like we are, and we've got, we, we, we do need to realize, I think, um, what you said is a powerful point. Lord, how can you use me at the body of Christ today? If I'm a liver, help me clean the blood out today. If I'm, if I'm an eyeball, help me to help someone see something. I think coming to church with the mentality of how do I spur each other on towards love and good works is the way to walk in the doors of any church. And perhaps you're spurring on the guy who's standing up here trying to preach. 
mm. by having a, a teachable face or a hug on the way out or a note or an email. Like not falling asleep. You know, uh, yeah, maybe not falling asleep. <laughs> Those are, you know, let's, let's spur him on a little bit too. Or the guy who's trying to put the worships uh, together or the young girl who agrees to sing that, that week or the guy who's out doing the ushering, et cetera, et cetera. Enough said. Great. Thank you for that. That's why I said I'd love to have a conversation with this person. Yeah, and I would also invite, if you're hearing that response to your question um, and you want to clarify or ask <laughs> a follow-up question, we would love to answer that. SherryWorrell.com. <laughs> <laughs> Don't start. That's... No, I'm, All right, this I'm next publicizing question. it. SherryWorrell.com. <laughs> Uh, this next question, how oh, should the church this. in America celebrate Black History Month? Well, uh, my response is we should celebrate uh, the accomplishments, the people uh, of, of uh, that. Let me put it this way. I think we should celebrate and honor and respect uh, everyone at every given opportunity. I don't think that it does the church uh, well to lean into man-made celebrations uh, of, of any kind. Um, and what immediately jumped to my mind was the passage in Revelation 7 that talks about what the, what the body is going to be like before Almighty God uh, when we're we're finally in that moment where every tongue, every tribe, every, every culture, every color, every ethnic group is going to be, you know, uh, actively involved in worshiping the Lord. I, I think to pull out one, one group, no matter how uh, intense the, the, the difficulties are at that moment, to, 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 to put a label on it, this is the month that we're going to honor X, it shorts it short sights it. It doesn't give it its enough of its due. We should give uh, our, the black history and the heroes in our in our in our culture that that were black their due all the time, not just during a, a given month mm -hmm. that's announced. And I and I think the church plays a role in that by the way we treat people of every color and every race and every every kind on a regular, ongoing basis. That's my opinion. Yeah, I um, thought about this one, and um, I was trying to think. You know, I always purpose to default Bible, right? So I want to stay away from my opinion. So I started thinking through, okay, where does the Bible celebrate people? Um, does the Bible celebrate people? Is there a place for it in the church? And I think it's a really good question, um, and, and I think the question is, how should. So there's an expectation from this person that there should be some form of celebration. And I really believe the Spirit led me to Hebrews 11. I was just going to say, let's have a Hebrews 11 month yeah. every month. Because the Bible celebrates people of faith. And um, like I might mention a William Carey or a Hudson Taylor who William Carey, the father of modern day missions, I would definitely mention a Martin Luther King Jr. Sure, as someone who I believe um, really was an instrumental tool in the hand of God to accomplish something in this nation. Um, it, it was obvious looking at his life that he was an anointed preacher of the gospel. And so I think the Bible does celebrate people. Um, and I think uh, having a, celebra a celebration, and I love what you said, Sherry, because it doesn't just celebrate Jews. It celebrates Rahab, who had faith. And she was a Jerichoan, you know, who, had, uh, who came to faith. And so I just uh, it celebrates Samson, who, you know, for all lack of short terms, basically committed suicide. Um, and it's, it's like, God help me so I can kill myself right now. You know, <laughs> it's like, you know, we see these people in the Bible from every perspective and everything that they did. Um, I just think your answer is so clear. We should celebrate heroes of faith, heroes that, um, set an example of what it means to follow Jesus.
I, I would add a little PS though. It is true, we would have to be honest, that certain groups of people, in this case we're talking about specifically black Americans, who, who because of the way the rest of the culture has treated their part of society, there are not enough stories and emphases and opportunities to know about so that we can honor and we can celebrate key individuals of faith. And we do need to do a better job of listening and writing and highlighting uh, the achievements and the accomplishments of, of men and women of faith. We don't do a very good job of that. Mm -hmm. um, if you go to in the Christian schools and you're looking at the, the section in the library on the biographies of, of heroes, there's, you know, there's 20 that we tell the story over and over and over again. Well, there are a whole lot more than 20 people who have done amazing things for God. So we need to encourage young people today to, to go get their degrees and write stories about those who are not being told about so that we can honor them uh, yeah. in, 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 every, uh, in every regard. Yeah, Sherry, we have Black History Month. So how do I use this to highlight a man of faith that changed the course and direction of our country? Great. I mean, if we could emulate Martin Luther King Jr. and his faith, his fortitude, his strength, we would define Christian because he, to me, is Christian. But we need more stories. We need more people other than just one. Well, I'm just highlighting Martin Luther King Jr. because um, he's just one of faith that yeah. I can think of right now. There is a myriad of people of faith um, that uh, I think we could celebrate. Yeah. And so, to me, it's let's use the month for the sake of the gospel. Mm. Um, it's like uh, uh, George Washington Day, right? Um, is it just a day off or am I gonna use this day to hang with my family and to talk about American history and culture and the, the positives and negatives of George Washington? I'm gonna use Martin Luther King Jr. and I'm gonna use this month to celebrate what God did in this nation, I think, uh, for the sake of um, really changing the course of our nation, an anointed man of God. So I, I think you guys spoke very thoroughly to the, okay, how do, we, how do we celebrate? How do we do that as a church? Maybe a follow-up question. There are a lot of, like you mentioned Martin Luther King, there are a lot of events or holidays that naturally spring the um, opportunity or the ex and or the expectation that say this should be talked about this should be something that happens how do you respond to that and the expectations of people because i mean i you have martin luther king day you have july 4th you have president's day you have and do you celebrate all of those mm -hmm. in the church do you celebrate none of those if you start to pick and choose well, it's like I've, well why did we celebrate yeah. this and we didn't celebrate this i've and, learned as leaders act I can't live up to one expectation. So uh, I, I, for me as a leader here at this church, um, I purpose to be led by the Spirit and live up to His expectations of what He wants to accomplish at this church. And um, I'm human. So I have uh, forgotten some things. Uh, I have, uh, I, but I think... Our nation is in a place right now where this particular topic is very hot. And I have discovered whatever I say, one way or the other, can be taken about a thousand ways. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important to be very sensitive, to be very understanding, to listen, and to purpose to meet people where they're at and... Um, walk that road with a lot of confidence. Yeah, I think we, we do have to be careful to not, uh, it's kind of like just because Hallmark says it's a day, it doesn't mean it's a day for the believer. You know, Groundhog's Day, let's all go get cards and, and send out Groundhog's Day cards. I, I, I think the church is, has the freedom to have a 4th of July picnic, uh, but is not under a, a constraint to let 
the the emphasis on what the Fourth of July represents to us as a as a culture necessarily to drive the activities of the church. Yeah, I've always looked at it this way: the days are evil. Redeem the time. How do I redeem Fourth of July for the sake of Christ? How do I redeem uh, Mother's Day or Father's Day? We don't see any of those practices in the, in the church. Right. But how do I use it to redeem it? If someone's going to invite their unsaved mother so I can celebrate Mother's Day, fishing net, I'll use it for God's glory. For sure. Great. We're going to do a speed round. We have three questions left, and one of them requires all of us answering. So this first one, what is the difference between prophesying and teaching? Sorry, um, we're going to do a speed round. <laughs> I was giving I, preference. Just kidding. I was giving preference. Well, in, in, in the Bible, prophecy is focused on providing revelation. Um, in the old days, we used to talk about in an Old Testament prophet, sometimes they were forth telling, just telling the truth, and sometimes they were foretelling, telling about the future. Mm -hmm. Prophecy uh, in, in the New Testament context it tends to be more of the providing revelation, the Holy Spirit directly controlling an outcome, directly uh, giving a, a very spontaneous revelation that's unique and specific to them and the, and, the, and the circumstances that the Spirit is controlling. Teaching, on the other hand, is more of uh, explaining or applying what has been re revealed, either in the, in the written word of God or in the case of you were standing next to a prophet, I suppose you could teach what they had to say. Um, so the, the real question had to do with, is there a difference between preaching and teaching? And preaching and teaching are synonymous. It doesn't really matter whether you're, you know, standing, sitting, or, or whatever in terms of the teaching. But prophecy has more to do with a specific Holy Spirit given for this moment revelation as opposed to the teaching of what has been yeah. given. That was, I could very, be, that was very quick. Yeah. Did Thank my you. best. Great. I could be teaching and the Lord use it prophetically. So I could be teaching, honor your father and your mother, that it may go well with you. Hey, gang, teenagers, listen up. Um, you choose to dishonor, it ain't going well. So I'm being used prophetically to let them know, here's your future if you choose to not be obedient to the scripture. Prophecy will always align with scripture. Always align with scripture. Um, and God will confirm the prophet. So if I speak into your life something and it does not come to pass, by right, come to me and say, hey, dude, like, you need to stop the prophecy gig because it didn't happen, you know, um, so <laughs> in some sense, you know. Yeah. And I think we're afraid to do that. Um, but I also think we're afraid to use the gift of prophecy because um, it is the forth telling and foretelling of God's word. And I, when you're preaching and teaching, I've always said um, it, it, it's a connection to style. A preacher is someone that is kind of like, you know, to, uh, me a little bit. A teacher is very much like the two of you. You guys are great teachers. Your style is methodic. You're well understood. There's a linear, I'm like a cloud that just pours on you. Yeah, but it's a, it's a similar term in that we'll say, well, what did he teach on this morning? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, That's why I related to them, style. We see them, you know, similarly, but mm -hmm. anyway. Great. Great. I went a little longer than you. Sorry, Sherry. <laughs> Speed round. Great. This next question for all three of you, what does your time with Jesus look like daily? Mm. Sherry? I assume they're asking, what is my devotional life like? Yeah, I think that's okay. the question. Um, I try to do my, my, uh, the reading portion of my devotional life first thing in the morning. Um, uh, try very hard to do it before I do other things. Um, I have a, um, a preference to read through the Bible continuously uh, on a continuous loop. Uh, I've been doing that for almost 20 years. It allows me to not... Um, cherry pick the stuff that's a little more uh, fun and easy. Uh, it, it makes me work my way through the whole council. Of, like I'm of done God. with Jeremiah. Well, I, but, to that, <laughs> but to that point, almost every time I get to the major prophets, I have the same thing. It's like, how many times can you say clean up your act judgment's coming? So I, in addition to the chronology kind of, not chronology, the, the continuous loop of reading, I, I get it, it takes me about somewhere between six and nine months to, to read through the, the whole Bible mm. in my devotional time. But I, I, I always try to add 
something that, that um, especially if I'm bogged down, I, like I just finished the Old Testament, I'm starting the Gospels, inevitably by the time I get in the middle to the end of Luke, I, I'm going to go, all right, already, I know where Jesus went, I know, you know. So I, at those moments, I try to go to the other, to the other uh, Testament. So in the case of that, I'd probably jump back and maybe take uh, uh, Psalm 119 and, and, and work on that in addition to the devotional life. So I, I, right now, when I finished the Old Testament, I was, I've been reading and thinking and applying, hopefully, Colossians. I was really working my way through Colossians over and over and over again while I was in the, the latter part of the Old Testament. So devotional time usually in the morning. I don't journal. I do have what I call my nugget book, uh, which is probably similar, but it's not a journal. Um, my prayer time tends to be uh, in the evening uh, as opposed to in the morning. And I'm not sure why. I think maybe because at one point in my life I got convicted of how many people during the day I would say to, I'll, I'll pray for you. And then I go home and at the end of the day go, well, who's that? And so now I have a, a little bit more handle on making certain that my prayer time is a little more intentional in the evening. Yeah, I think there is a morning and evening sacrifice. So mm -hmm. I find some kind of spiritual practice morning and evening. And I would say it revolves around read, pray, listen. So read the scripture, talk to God, and listen to someone explain the scripture to me. That's a daily practice of mine. Yeah. Great. He was more succinct than me. That was much shorter. Yes, I'll was. probably be more like you. Um, mine depends on the season. And normally I like to go through scripture very slow because I like to pick it apart. But right now I'm challenging myself to have a greater intake. Um, so I'm on a reading plan and I read from um, the goal each day is I have 10 chapters and it's from all different portions of scripture. So it's mm -hmm. like a psalm, a psalm a day, a proverb a day, an acts, a chapter and acts a day, and then seven different other areas. And um, it's, it's cool to see the pieces come together. So I find myself, I gotta, I gotta pause and, you know, kind of pray through something. And so I, I really just try to, um, take every moment I can, whether driving or at lunch or, uh, with four kids, I don't really have a set time. That's like, Hey, this is extra protected. Um, you try to get up early and then they're up early, you try to stay up late and then something happens. So I, I just, go, okay, this is my priority, and wherever it fits in, um, I'm going to make sure that I get it in today. I think it's really good for young parents to hear what he just said. I was just, just going to say the same thing. Give people the freedom yeah. to recognize the events of their life and not be discouraged and stop. Because it, it's hard. It's oh. like, hey, this is how it happens, and then it doesn't happen that way, and then you live in... Yeah. Oh, I missed it again. So good. I'm in a more of a routine because my kids are a little bit older. So I'm easy. it's easy for me to do in a morning and evening sacrifice thing. Um, I, I, I think it's important that people hear however you can. You know, even if there's a daily bread in the bathroom, like whatever it is, <laughs> you know, just make sure you're getting that daily injection of the yeah. word. Um, and what, you know, I, I know that about you, Z, because I'll get a verse from you sometimes like six in the morning and sometimes 1030 at night. So it's like, OK, he's in his devotions. <laughs> yeah. And there are there's some routine to it. Right. It's like Audrey and I listen to a proverb at night before we go to bed. So that's a routine. I try to take the gospel chapter and spend a little more time in that. And I'll kind of breeze through Deuteronomy or my Genesis chapter or right. It's like some of the story ones you can just kind of go through quicker than some of the other chapters. But that's that's how I'm doing it right now. Uh, this last question, how would you counsel a young man who feels called toward lay pastoral ministry? Paul David Tripp wrote a great book, Dangerous Calling. Mm. Um, I think it's a, a good evaluation book um, to take a look at. Uh, I think interview someone who's been in the ministry for 30 years or more. You know, ask them, find out what it used to be, what it is now, get some good godly counsel. Um, and uh, I would... Um, Make sure you're serving at your church uh, mm -hmm. and that you're an active person in regards to serving. You're putting into practice the things. It's Ezra, right? Ezra sought the Lord, prepared his heart, did it, and then he taught it. Mm -hmm. um, so I would 
uh, find some class maybe to take about biblical theology or something just to grow your knowledge, but to put it into practice. Um, so those are some things I would say. But Paul David Tripp is a uh, Dangerous Calling is a great book to b- start with. Great. I was just taking the approach of maybe some scripture to look at and was suggesting that they camp in First and Second Timothy. Hmm. Uh, there's both some very practical uh, discussions from Paul to, to mm-hmm. the young preacher boy, and, and also, I shouldn't call him a boy, young preacher, and, uh, and, and then some very spiritual things to you know, train yourself to be godly and a bunch of other things like that that, that would be good for him, First and Second Timothy. Yeah, we're um, in the middle of uh, ordination, year-long investment into the guys here at Coast Hills. And um, we went, th- we started in 1 Timothy 4 and 2 Timothy 3. And just, okay, here's what you're moving in. And the, the, one of the things I pointed out was um, we don't see in Scripture the term pastor being given to anyone. We see it as a gift that's given to people. What we see the pastor called, so he calls Timothy a good minister a servant. Mm. And it's offering the gift of pastor to the body that you have, that you, the Lord has entrusted you with. And I think that's a, a, a good way to have a head start with going into ministry. Great. Well, thank you guys so much for conversation today. Um, as always, if you have any questions from our conversation or anything you're facing or learning throughout the week, you can send those in by text to 949-301-7300, or you can email those to connect at coasthillschurch.org. Uh, otherwise, we hope to see you on Sunday, or you can join us online. God bless you guys.